Hello and welcome to this week's Australian Stock Market Report. Now this week we're going to take a deep dive look at VAS, the Vanguard Index Tracking ETF. We'll also look at stop losses and then we'll get into the Australian stock market so I can share with you my thoughts on where it's heating along with answering your questions and looking at stocks for you. Hello, I'm Dale Gillan, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth Within and we're Australia's most trusted stock market educators. Now, before we move on, thank you for showing your support for our channel and hitting that subscribe button. Now, remember, as you subscribe, click that bell on the right of it so you keep up to date with our latest videos. Also, remember to tune into our live Australian stock market show, which is on every Tuesday, 7 to 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Time. This is the show where you get to ask us, the stock market education and trading experts, to look at your favorite stocks and answer all of your questions. Now, it is at this time of year that we do start to hear about the October effect on the stock market and how this is the scariest month in the calendar year for investors. Currently, the All Ordinaries Index is down just over 6%, and with just five trading days left in September, investors are wondering if the Australian stock market will have a meltdown in October. To fuel the fear, the stories will be written about the Black Tuesday crash in October 1929 and the Black Monday crash in October 87, but is October really a month that investors should fear? Looking at the data over the last 40 years since 1982, October has closed down 14 times, which means statistically October is likely to rise 65% of the time. When comparing this to September and November over the last 40 years, each month has closed lower on 20 occasions, meaning there is a 50% chance that they would end in positive territory. That said, the market has only fallen across all three months on four occasions, but October has had the largest swings in price, with the highest being 10%, whilst the biggest fall was 42.45% in the October 1987 crash. Now, unless we see a significant rise this week, September 2022 is likely to close down, and outside of the four times that all three months fell together, only five times in the past has October ended the month down after September fell. That means, statistically speaking, the next month has a 77% chance of closing up. Looking at more recent history since 2000, following a down month in September, October has only closed lower on three occasions, one of which was during the GFC, while the others occurred in 2000 and the most recent in 2018. Given this is an 86% probability that October 2022 will close up for the month. Now, whilst I'm not ruling out that October could end in negative territory, the statistics indicate that we do not need to fear October. Now it's time we take a look at what were the best and worst performing sectors last week. Well, the best performing sectors included materials, and that was down 1.02%, followed by financials down 1.68% and energy, that was down 2.09% last week. The worst performing sectors, they included information technology, and that was down 6.49%, followed by utilities down 5.38%, and consumer discretionary, that was down 4.90%. The best performers in the S&P ASX top 100 stocks included Whitehaven Coal, that was up 6.60%, followed by Pilbara Minerals, up 5.66%, and Washington H. Sol Patterson, up 5.27%. The worst performing stocks included Block, down 16.63%, followed by Domino's Pizza, down 12.65%, ARB Corporation, down 10.26%. Before we get into my thoughts on the Australian stock market, if you are new to the stock market or you've been reading books and watching YouTube videos, but you're still struggling to make money, lack confidence or unsure what you need to do, then consider enrolling in our trading mentor course. This course will change how you view the market. It will increase your probability of success and greatly improve the profits that you can make. In our trading mentorship program, we will improve your probability of a winning trade as you'll learn how to combine technical and fundamental analysis to stocks and you get expert support from myself and our team along the way. To find out more, visit wealthwithin.com.au and click on the education tab in the menu or give us a call on 1300 858 272. So what do I expect in the market? Well, Let's get into the charts for our S&P 500 All Ordinaries Index update for this week. 
We'll also answer your questions and look at the stocks that you've chosen for me. Well, what an interesting week. Last week it was on the Australian stock market. I know I say that all the time. There seems to be a lot happening on our market and sometimes it doesn't do what I expect. And, and last week really wasn't one of those ones that I actually expected. But hey, it wasn't out of the norm for what I was talking about and why I constantly said over the last month, you know, we do need to wait for confirmation of direction, not speculate that the market is rising up. Because after eight weeks rising, our market has had a few weeks down. But let's go and take a look at the charts to see exactly what did happen last week, what my thoughts are for the next uh, next few weeks, and even, even in, right through to Christmas, I'll talk a bit about today as well. But on your screen at the moment, on the left is the monthly chart, and on the right is the weekly chart. And I'm going to have a look at the monthly chart, because uh, last couple of weeks, I think I've only looked at the weekly chart. But you can see, if I expand it up, you'll see currently the monthly chart. You can see how September is down. The September is down about 6%, as I mentioned a little bit earlier in the report. So you can see there to that low there, it's about 6.05%. Uh, our market is down. Now, we're still above the low that we had there in June at 6581 points. So that's still the low from the high. And our fall is still 1728 from the all-time high back in January this year. So this year has been a pretty much a, a CREP year from our market's point of view. And if you've been buying and holding since, you know, January 2021, um, so you know, nearly, we're getting close to January 2023, so nearly two years, you've pretty much just collected dividends through here. And even if you're going right back through to here, if we're looking at, uh, you know, July 2019, you know, you'd still be struggling with your performance over the last two or three years if you were buy and hold and you had an index tracking type of portfolio where you were doing that. But right now, has this, is this the low 6581? Well, we still don't know yet. We still haven't confirmed that it's definitely the low, uh, and we haven't confirmed whether the market will fall down to this area or whether we might get a little bit of a bounce. Now, you remember on my arrows that I, I draw my weekly chart, and I've talked about it a couple of times, that we thought the market could move up and come back down, and how far this move would depend on how big the move out of it would be and whether it went below that. So they're all my two scenarios, and why I keep saying wait for confirmation, and while that eight weeks straight up, was a really, really good strong sign and I was starting to get a lot more bullish. I was still always wary that we could actually break below that 6581 points. But let's now go and have a look at the weekly chart and get a little bit more detail. Because you will remember, and, and this I'm still haven't changed this, I've just made these arrows more translucent so we can see the bars under it. So these arrows haven't, I haven't moved these for ages as you people have been watching this for a long time. And I did say to you, when the market does come down, it would determine whether this red one was the actual um, scenario or the green one, depending on how far it came down. If it came down a little bit to that sort of 7,600, 6,900 points, I thought the market would be very bullish right through to the end here. And if it came below, it could challenge that low in June. And so this is why I've always got two scenarios and why, I mean, I do know some people get frustrated with me doing that and saying, well, you know, they'll just pick a direction, tell us what it's going to do. And nobody knows what it's going to do with 100% probability. It's always our best guess based on what we're seeing at the time. So whilst I knew the market was going to come down for a few weeks, how long I wasn't certain. I thought two, maybe three weeks might do it, um, but not necessarily one, two, three, four, five weeks down. I didn't think we would do that. And I did say about 6,800 points was my sort of bottom end target for this market or this fall. Uh, the other week, I said there was support there at 6,800, uh, which is just, it went through there on uh, last week. You can see there the lower 6,756. So it is interesting at the moment. Now, I'm not discounting the market will come down and double bottom with that low there in June. It could do that. It could come all the way down, turn and then go up. If it does that, the rise up will be quite spectacular, I think. But um, if it's going to turn, my guess is it'll turn this week. Now, I'm not going to tell you why I think it'll turn this week. Um, or get into all the technical reasons why it might turn this week. But if we get an inside bar or a bar that moves up and closes higher than this, we may see it dip a little bit earlier in the week, like Monday, Tuesday, and then close high. Or if it just rises up and it's inside bar this week uh, and starts to pull back up again, then we may see this beautiful, spectacular rise that will, that will break that high there at 7386 over the next sort of four to eight weeks-ish, moving right through into Christmas time and maybe even a little bit longer. It could even be right through to the end of January, even into February. But that remains to be seen. But I'm still a bit conservative. I'm still not 100% convinced that this June low is the low. 
Uh, but I'm not, but I'm more convinced that it is, and I think our market will do okay over the coming months. But again, you know, uh, this is another point, and I think this is probably a really good um, point to say. It is I know a lot of people out there go, Dale, you said this, and then they take it as if that is 100% certainty. The only thing certain in life we've got is once you're born, you know you're going to die. That's the certainty that you have. Oh, and taxes is the other one you're certain are going to happen. Everything else and anything to do with the market, nothing is certain. And this is why I keep saying to people, you know, we do need to make sure that the direction does trade on confirmation, not speculation. And why I say, hey, this is my best guess today. This is what I think will happen. And it's always based on probability. Like the early part of this report when I said, you know, right now the probability that October is up is quite high based on the last 40 years of October's. So therefore, I can assume as a trader or as an investor that it is likely to do that. But it, if I'm saying it's 80% chance of rising, there's still a 20% chance that it's going to fall. And we need to be prepared for both. So people, you know, I mean, we do get those people coming out going, Dale, you said this and it didn't happen. You got no idea. And I do see some of those comments that people put out. Experts get it wrong all the time. Well, no, experts do not get it wrong all the time. It's just that your expectation is that they get it right 100% of the time. And when that's not met, you're, you have unrealized expectation. And when you get unrealized expectations, that leads to resentment. And that's what people do. And, and to me, you know, you see that skepticism all the time, you know, in YouTube all over the place. Somebody thinks because somebody said something that it must happen and when it doesn't, they just think that person doesn't know what they're talking about. But experts get it right. Most of the time, if you can get it right 60% of the time, you're pretty good. If you can get it right 70% of the time, you're pretty good. But I think, you know, Jenny and I get the market right pretty much 80, 90% of the time. We get pretty much what we're talking about. It may not be exactly like we talk about, hey, a peak's coming soon, like I was talking about with the eight weeks up. You know, I said, right, this is unusual. We are going to go down shortly. So, but it may not be this week or next week, or it might be a couple of weeks away. If we think, you know, even with uh, the COVID crash, we didn't pick the crash crash if that makes sense. We didn't expect it to fall that far. But if you look at our videos in the weeks before that, we're saying the market's going to come down. Well, I thought sort of, you know, 10%, maybe up to 15%, that was about it. But then COVID happened. And if COVID happened, hadn't happened, that's probably what would have happened. But COVID was an event-driven type crash, not an economic thing or not a normal cycle thing. So we do get it right most of the time. But the point I'm saying to you is, and what we the important thing is, don't, don't 100% trust any expert, whether they're a broker or a fund manager or anybody else, because we're humans. We have beliefs. We have. Uh, we do make mistakes at times too. Always know yourself what you should be doing. But again, it's also one thing I teach our traders is you are 100% responsible for everything. If you invest, you're responsible. If you don't invest, you're responsible. If you make money, you're responsible. If you lose money, you're responsible. And you need to take that attitude. So look at what the experts are talking about. Look at the market. Look at what's telling you and then make your own decision. And don't point the finger at others if it doesn't go the way you want it to go. Um, but that's really my take on the All Lords at the moment. As I said, to me, over the next few weeks, if it's going to turn, I believe it will probably turn today. Not today, this week, sorry. And we'll have a close up this week. If it keeps going down this week, we'll probably least best double bottom with the low in June. Otherwise, we might fall through that. But I don't think we're going to fall through that too much. Either way, I think the low is very close. It might happen in the next few weeks. And then our market will start to move up. But you know, what if it does break that June low, I'll have to reassess what I'm thinking at before Christmas um, or what what the rise is before Christmas, but if it does start to trade up this week, then I think we you know we still could challenge the the all time high, you know, sort of in around you know by the by Christmas or even into January uh, that sort of period. But again, it's irrelevant. What we right what we need to do right now, if I can get my mouth to work, is just confirm direction first, stay out of the market until we understand direction, and then go with that direction when it does start to turn up and and confirm to us that it's moving up. But that's it for my take on the market. Now we'll get into your questions. Now the first question we have today is from Xiao Su. I think that's how you say it. And please excuse me if I didn't uh, pronounce it uh, correctly. Xiao Su, I believe it is. And it's really sort of a, a um, how do I explain it? We've had a couple of questions over the last couple of weeks regarding index ETFs and specifically one called VAS. And, and somebody mentioned and asked me a question. Well, I talked about index ETFs 
Um, and then somebody asked me a question on Baz, and then Zhao Su has come back with another question. So what I've gone and done is done a little bit of research to show you a whole lot of stuff here. And, and I'm going to preface it before I actually read the question. I'm going to preface it to say this has nothing to do with Vaz itself, if that makes sense, or Vanguard, who is, you know, it's, it's their index tracking ETF. Um, so, and, and it's not necessarily, and it's not from a point of view that I don't, um, I'm against ETFs. I'm happy for people to invest in ETFs as long as they understand what they're going to do. But let's get into the question now and you'll understand what I'm talking about here. Zhao Su says, hi Dale, thanks for the show, I really like it. However, I do not quite get your point about index funds. For example, if people are panic and trying to sell VAS, isn't that the same thing as selling BHP CB, or CBA? VAS just means um, 300 stocks in the ASX. I do not see the difference between selling BHP and VAS if shareholders are panic. If VAS reaches the bottleneck you mentioned in the video, then BHP will have the same problem. Thanks again. Let me and. What I want to do here is just before I, I get into answering all these questions is BHP is a stock. VAS is an exchange traded fund. That's completely different. So one is you're buying a company and you're buying assets in a company, BHP, CBA, whatever that are. And that company has assets that the company owns and it has a board and it runs and it's, it's driving revenue from whatever it does, whether that's a goods or services or you know, in the terms of BHP, it's it obviously mining iron ore and other things that it does and CBA is financial institution that provides services in that. So that's one thing. So a stock is different than an ETF. So whilst an ETF is exchange traded, which means it's quoted on the ASX and you can buy um, units or shares in that fund through the ASX. The fund is actually a managed fund that's run by fund managers who manage multiple different funds. So Vanguard is a huge, huge corporation that runs many, many, many different funds, not just VAS. BHP is BHP, that's what it does. So BHP even and, and CBA and, and those big stocks, you can always buy and sell those freely all of the time because funds like VAS buy BHP or sell BHP. So that's a huge big difference to me. So you've always got multiple different funds buying and selling stocks like BHP and CBA because they have different mandates that they run. So a mandate basically, basically means the rules of what they're going to do. So which means if there's a mandate for the top 20 stocks, so you have a top 20 stocks fund, then all they can do is buy and sell the top 20 stocks. Now funds will have that, so they'll also have index tracking ones, which means whatever the tracking, however a, a stock, size of a stock makes up the index, meaning the, uh, let's say the All Ordinaries, all ordinaries or the, or the yeah, XJO, which is the top 200 stocks or the 300, FAS is the 300, uh, the 300. So if BHP makes up, and I'll just use a round figure, 10% of the 300, the top 300 stocks, so its weighting is 10%, then VAS would have to buy 10% of BHP. That's what I mean. Whereas as you as an individual, you don't have to, you can buy whatever proportion you like. Uh, but it's, there's a lot more to it than that in terms of this completely two separate different investments and different products. Yes, VAS invests in the 300, this is what it says, but BHP doesn't have to do that. And BHP will always be, it makes its money from selling goods and services. VAS makes its money from whatever the stock market is doing. So if BHP is going up and down, so is the stocks, other stocks, or BHP within that portfolio, if that makes sense. Um, but again, I've never seen a crash that you can't sell top 20 stocks like BHP. It's more illiquid stocks, yeah, you might find bottlenecks, but not in the big stocks because there's trillions of dollars going into super and every week you get paid and every week money goes from your pay into your super. And they're always, and if a super fund is buying the mandate is Australian equities and it's the top 200 stocks, then it still needs to keep buying those equities. So you'll always find buyers for those in other different managed funds that are and, and other funds from around the world. So you'll always have demand for really, really good stocks, but not necessarily for a, an ETF. Like for example, if, some, if the world's panicking and wanting to get out of the ETF, then they've got to unwind all their positions because they've got to sell BHP so that they could actually let you redeem your, your position in VAS, if that makes sense. So they've got to start selling stocks in proportion to the index, etc. It starts to get a bit complicated, so I won't go too far into it. But 
Let me explain, you know, the, uh, and I'll explain a few details here. The fund size of VAS is, and, and I hope you're sitting down for this, VAS is 11 0.25 billion dollars. That's how much money's in VAS. That's what it's worth at the moment. This is from the ASX website, and its benchmark, as I just, just discussed just briefly, is the S&P ASX 300. So it invests in the top 300 shares. So that's really what its mandate is. What I explained. So they have to, and their goal is to track the performance of the top 300. So when you're talking about the 300 index, that's what they're aiming to track. Okay, and according to the ASX, this company or VAS is holding 310 companies. And you go, how does it hold 310 companies when it's only supposed to hold the top 300? Good question to ask VAS, isn't it? Why are they holding 10 extra companies? But we do see the index moves in and out all the time. As you know, every, every period of time, there's stocks that will move in and out of an index when they index re. And so when that happens, they have to reweight their, their portfolio. So if you have 30 companies coming out of the top 300 and 30 companies going in, they would have to sell 30 companies and buy 30 companies. You'll see stocks that move into the top 100, top 50, top 20. And when that happens, then it creates more participation in that buying of that. Because as a stock moves into the higher index, then there's more demand from the bigger end of town who have mandates to have to hold these companies. Uh, in their portfolio. So this is how this the market works. It's really under, good to understand how the market works. And they do re, re weight or redo the indexes on a quarterly basis. Now I'm gonna read something from their PDS. Now their PDS is freely available and the PDS is called a product disclosure statement. And then you can freely get that from the ASX website. So if you go to the ASX website, or you just type in VAS um, ASX, it'll, the ASX website will come up and you can see all the announcements for VAS, but you can also get their PDS for free, okay? And you should be able to get it from Vanguard itself as well. So if you go to their website and type in the research for VAS, you should be able to get their PDS. It has to be freely available to you, their PDS. And the PDS is how everything works. And I can guarantee, well, I can speculate that most people that are in the, who are in in ETFs at the moment have never taken a look at the PDS. And I would say that's probably 80, maybe 90% of people have never read the PDS. Or if they have, they've just opened up, looked at the fee section and closed it down. That's pretty much what they do. And if you own ETFs right now in your portfolio, ask yourself, have you fully read the PDS? And most of you will be sitting there going, no, I didn't. And I go, that's my strong recommendation that if you're in an ETF, regardless of who the ETFs, whether it's a Vanguard, one or beta shares or whoever it is, read the PDS. If you're in a managed fund, read the PDS. If you're in any type of managed investment, read the PDS. Because unless you understand the positives and negatives, the risks you're associating with that investment, how do you make a proper investment decision? Just because it's the top 300 stairs, shares doesn't mean you should duck your head. Because this is what they call an over-the-counter type product, is somebody's managing that for you. Whereas BHP, you're buying the stock itself. And obviously it has a board of directors and being a shareholder, you are owner of that company. With Vanguard, you don't own Vanguard. You're just an investor in one of their ETFs. That's what you are. So you need to understand that. So quoting from the PDS, so as I said, go to the ASX website, download the PDS or open it up. It's about 40 something pages. Um, and it really will help you understand the details, you know, what, is, what is happening with Vanguard and their, that ETF and how they will deal with you, how they charge their fees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you really do need to really look at that. But as I said to you, you, know, um, you, know, you, you really do need to understand what's in that PDF. So as I said, Vanguard's $11.25 billion, so it does take up a huge chunk of money or it's a huge, huge, uh, um, uh, big, big, big fun. So in the PDS, it says the Vanguard freely, uh, what you can get freely get from the, from the website. If Vanguard says none of the Vanguard group incorporated Vanguard Investments Australia Limited, all their related entities, directors or officers gives any guarantee or assurance as to the performance of or the repayment of capital or income. Let me say that again. So they're not guaranteeing the performance. And we understand that. That's you know, past performance, not an indication of future performance. But they're not guaranteeing the capital or income invested in the ETF described in this PDS. That's directly from their PDS. So they're not guaranteeing the capital or the income. 
Who gives them the capital? You do. So I'm not saying that's a negative or a positive. All I'm saying is that's in their PDS. So they're not guaranteeing anything. And a lot of people think, well, you know, I'm just invested in this, so I'm gonna you know, get my money out. No, you're not. Because it's gonna, the price of that PDS is gonna go up and down and how much it goes up and down, well, depending on how much money you get to redeem from that, if it goes higher, which you'd hope it would be, you'll get more money out of it or more capital. But if it goes lower, you may get less capital, so not guaranteeing all that. Just the same as BHP, you might buy it at $10, it rises to 30, you make $20. If it goes to five, you lose $5. Same sort of thing. Also in the PDS, it outlines that the funds may engage in securities lending. Now this is the something that Janine talks about all of the time. Securities lending means the stocks that are held within that fund, they can lend to somebody else to short sell. And I won't go hugely into that, but you know Janine, if you're watching our live show, you know Janine really has a big, big problem with this. Okay, now the risk of these funds, so if you're investing in an ETF, and this is again in their PDS, the risk of the funds in, a, in this ETF that they're talking about called fund risk, operational risk, trading risk, counterparty risk, and spread risk. So there's multiple different risks that you need to understand. There's a few more that I didn't even quote, but spread risk is really, really interesting because I pretty much didn't know that you're, you probably may not be aware that cash transactions are subject to variations in applicable buy-sell spread. So if you're directly redeeming from that, uh, from VAS, this is how they charge you more fees because it may, what they buy and sell at, there's different unit pricing. And it's the same with any managed fund. This is really, really normal practice. If you direct, directly invest in a managed fund, your buy-sell spread was how they charge money uh, for fees. Um, because if BHP last sale is $10, it's possible you could still buy it for $10 or sell it for $10, it's possible. But you might find that the buy sell spread might be one cent in there because somebody selling it might want to charge you one cent more for it or, and you might be, but the buyer may be wanting to pay one cent less, like 9.99. But the funds have these buy sell spreads and, and quite often they're larger than one cent. But you think, you know, on a managed fund that, you know, if the last sale was $10, you could, could have a go at it buying it for $10. And the answer is no, you can't. It's because of those spreads. But that's also how they charge you fees or how charge you more fees. But it really does help you to understand that. Now, also in the PDS on page 13, it states, as a condition of ASIC equal treatment relief, ASIC requires that in certain circumstances, investors other than authorized participants have a right to redeem units directly with Vanguard. When ETF units are suspended from trading on the ASX for more than five consecutive ASX trading days, investors have a right to withdraw from a fund and receive a cash payment for their ETF units within a reasonable time frame, within 60 days of the date on which the redemption request is received, or such longer periods as permitted in accordance with the fund's constitution. So what that means is if the fund gets suspended because there's a big drive of people trying to get out of it and they can't redeem things fast enough, they'll suspend it on the ASX from trading the ASX. If they suspend it for more than five days, then any investor in, an e in that ETF or any one of those ETFs that this PDF covers, then have the right to go directly to Vanguard and request a redemption, which you'll fill out a piece of paper, etc., etc. Then they have an obligation to give you your money within 30 days, basically. But that also depends on their constitution. So you might read their constitution and might say, if, if, we're, in, if we're illiquid, we may not pay you all the money or there's no... You know what I mean? There could be other conditions in there that I haven't even read. And I've only just scanned this PDF at the moment. I'm going to keep going. It says, it goes on to say that in, on page 13 that there may be occasions where Vanguard may suspend application or redemption requests. So even your redemption request, again, it has to have these other rules first. If it's suspended for five days on the ASX first, it may even suspend redemption request so they can get some liquidity in the fund, etc. This is what happened with the um, real estate funds back in the, the GFC. So that's why I'm saying what I've, I'm saying before the last couple of weeks is, you know, I think ETS could be part of this ne the next crash that does actually happen or part of investors losing money. Now, for example, this may occur, this is still reading from the PS, this may occur around end of distribution period when Vanguard is calculating and paying 
the distributable income for the relevant period and during ASX settlement holidays or where there are other factors as determined by Vanguard which prevent the accurate calculation of unit prices. What would prevent the accurate calculation of unit prices? Hmm, that would be a market crash because the market's moving down so fast trying to revalue unit prices on a millisecond basis would be pretty tough. Um, and then obviously, you know, obviously unwinding positions and selling positions and all sorts of other stuff that they have to do to work out what you're going to get in your redemption or how you're going to do things. That would be pretty tough. And if they suspend it and the market's falling, if they suspend trading on it and the market's falling heavily, then it sort of compounds that sort of stuff. Uh, again, I've only just briefly read this PDF and skimmed it pretty much. Now, I've just used VAS as an example, and this was you know, uh, because it was the original question that we asked a couple of weeks ago. And I'm definitely not saying there is anything wrong with VAS or with Vanguard. You know, I'm only saying that if you invest in an ETF or any other managed product, then you should be really, really aware of what exactly that product is. And most people just think they're buying a stock and they think they're getting wide diversification with an index tracking ETF with 300 stocks in it. No, you're not. You're getting one. You're dealing with VAS. You're dealing with Vanguard. That's what you're dealing with. So it's basically the same as buying one stock. Is it the same as BHP? No, it's completely different than BHP. I can guarantee you on any crash, you'll be able to sell BHP shares. But on an index tracking ETF or a managed fund, mm, I'm not 100%, I can't be 100% certain going, yes, you'll be able to withdraw your money at any time on any index tracking ETF or any ETF for that matter. But again, I'm not saying don't invest in those. All I'm saying is invest with knowledge, invest knowing what could happen. And as I was saying the other week, and what we're talking about with Janine, when you start seeing a lot of borrowing on the market, it's all going into index tracking ETFs because people love them. And you can saw how big VAS was, you know, you know, the billions of dollars, it was 11 point something billion dollars. That's massive. If that grows to 300%, how are they going to handle all the redemptions coming through if people are panicking about the market? And you can't tell me they won't panic about the market because they did during COVID, they did during the GFC, and they will do so again. And because you can hit buttons on a keyboard and try and sell, there's just going to be a huge pipeline of sell orders coming in as people panic. And you're going to see these institutions suspended from trading. And if that goes on for more than four or five days, then there could be issues. That's all I'm saying is just make sure you protect yourself. So again, got a long-winded answer to a question, but hopefully it answers a lot of your questions. But also what I do hope is it brings up a lot more questions for you. And I really hope it makes you go look at all the, if you are in any ETF, just go and read the fine print, go and read the PDS and understand, highlight things. And if you don't understand something, ring the ETF provider itself, ring Vanguard, ring BetaShares, ring whoever it is, and ask them what that actually means and really get the detail because who's your money? Oh, sorry, who trusts your money? Or who trusts them? So, you know, to me is where do you, don't put your trust in everybody else, is understand who, who controls that money and that's you. And if you make it or lose it, it's your fault. So that's all I'm saying is just make sure you fully understand what you're doing. But I'll wrap that one up and go into the next question. But thanks for asking the questions and thanks for trying to get more out of us. Now, the next question we have is from Ross who says, great show, Dale. Can you please have a look at AGY and provide a comment on its likely direction? So I'm going to have a look at AGV that's on your screen right now. Um, it's called Argosy uh, Minerals. It's going up. That's pretty much what it's doing at the moment. How long it's going to go up, I can't really tell you how long it's going up without doing a lot of research. Um, but you don't actually don't you don't tell me whether you own it or you do, you, or you're looking at buying it. You know, if I'm if you are looking at buying it, you know, we're talking about this stock has risen very, very, very strongly um, since March 2020, the COVID low, and you can see there 2,200 percent. It's broken through that all-time high back there at 56 cents. It's it's a bit it's come off a little bit over the last week. There you can see a little bit there on last week. We've had two, three weeks up, a little bit weakness. Um, that doesn't surprise me after an all-time high. Like often I've said there before, when your stock breaks an all-time high, you get this vacuum that gets sucked up of people wanting to buy it once it breaks through that. And then when that exhaust, it drops back a little bit. <sighs> right now it's going up. If you're not in it, would I be getting into it? Mm. I'd be thinking about it, but I think I'd want a bit, I want to see it come back down again and 
give me sort of a higher trough and then see where the buyers and sellers are because this may have exhausted itself. And this is the thing when you see this, it, but if it hasn't exhausted itself now, it probably will in the not too distant future. So it just depends on your strategy, but really like, and like, and I'll just go quickly back to the Vanguard uh, thing. In their PDS, it says this is general advice in their PDS and it's not personal advice. So even reading the PDS is not personal advice for you. But it's the same with Janine and I, we're, we're licensed to give general advice rather than personal advice. When some people say to me, should I buy this stock? Janine and I will never tell you to buy a stock because that gets into personal advice and to do that, I've got to do a fact find and do statements advice and all sorts of other stuff, which is a whole lot of BS in my book and the financial services industry is over-regulated, but that's another story anyway. But in the end of the day, it's your choice and you need to understand what you're doing. So whilst we're giving you general advice here, it's not we're not saying, I don't know your specific circumstances and so just saying, what direction is this? It's really hard for me to really go, yeah, it's going up or it's going down because it's not a stock I've traded and I've not analysed this stock other than just the few seconds that I've just looked at the chart. It's going up right now, but if you're in it, I'd stay with it. If you're not in it, I'd um, think about whether I would get in it. But Absolutely, I would be setting a stop loss. That's what I'd be doing. So, but thank you for asking the question. Next one we got a uh, question we've got is from Shiva who says, "Hi Dale, great video. Thanks for the efforts every week. I hear you mention using stop losses several times. Are stop losses effective to protect against prices gapping down? Thanks again. Um, yeah. I was about to say yes, and it's. You can't just use a blanket statement yes or no on that one because if you're getting stocks that you own gapping down on you and gapping down heavily that they gap down through your stop losses, then there's one thing happened and we did, Janine and I talked about this on a live show, I think it was last week and maybe the week before, is that you're picking the wrong stocks or you got the wrong entry. You, your, your analysis is incorrect and you've bought in when you shouldn't or you're picking the wrong stocks completely. So stop losses are there to protect your capital. So you have initial stop loss and a trailing one, and we've talked about that in the past, and if you're not sure about what they are, again, I talk about them in my trading mentor course that I, I talked about a little bit earlier. So if you're really unsure, get into the course, because it's dirt cheap, it's like seriously dirt cheap. Um, and if, if you are spending a lot of time watching YouTube videos and reading books and are still confused, how much do you get paid an hour? And it's like, Seriously, just do the trading mental course and we'll sort all that for you. But what I'm saying is, is if you're getting stopped out, you will get, your stop losses aren't going to protect you if you're picking crappy stocks and low liquid stocks that might gap around 20, 30, 40% that can just go bang. And that it's really not going to protect you in that sort of circumstances. So wrong stock. Other times we see constantly see on, uh, on these questions that I get on Monday and obviously what we get on the Tuesday show, we see a lot of people buying the wrong buying into a stock completely at the wrong time and that's another a situation where you might get some gapping down so the answer is sort of 50 50 if you're doing the right analysis picking the right stocks then you'll never have to worry about it. stop losses will protect you pretty much most of the time and the really really odd occasion and i mean odd occasion because it's almost i can't remember the last time i had a stock gap below a stop loss of mine and me having, instead of taking a 15% loss, it was like 20 or 25%. I can't remember that happening. So that's what I mean is you have the right analysis and buy the right stocks at the right time. It's not an issue to, and stock loss, the answer is absolutely stop losses will protect you. So that's what I'm saying is it's not a just a really simple answer. It, as I said, if you are experiencing that sort of thing where the stocks are dropping below your stop losses uh, or gapping below them um, heavily, that means, again, to me, that tells me two things. One is... Either you have your, your very low level of knowledge and analysis skills, or number two, you're just getting the. If you if you've got high levels of knowledge and skill, then you're just trading the wrong stocks. That's pretty much I would pretty much guarantee that's what's going to is happening to you right now. But great question, and, and keep asking the questions. And thanks to everybody for sending in your questions. You know, uh, but unfortunately, as is the case every week, we just can't answer everybody's questions. You know, so but remember, the best chance to have your question answered on this show is to publicly subscribe to our channel and then type your questions down below in the comment sections. We do love that. Now remember that here on this channel, we also do these Monday Mark Reports each and every week. We also do our live stream every Tuesday night, 7 to 8 p.m. So Janine and I'll see you tomorrow night at 7 to 8 p.m. Remember, hit the subscribe button now. Click the bell on the right of it so you know when we upload and go live. And also, you've got to give us a big thumbs up. And you did okay last week. And again, if you're watching these every week and you're not giving us a big thumbs up, 
why not? That's showing your support for our channel and allowing other people to know that the content is good and that you enjoy it. That's it for me. I'm Dale Gillam, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth, with him goodbye, good luck, and good trading.